Peace Fellowship first recipient for the Michael D. Denver Peace Fellowship, and I do have plans to attend law school this fall. All right, so uh, before we introduce a little bit about the event, we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about CCE and what we do. Um, so at the Center of Pacific Engagement, our mission is includes the objective of fostering student awareness of local, national, and global issues and encouraging students to be active citizens and contributors to their local, national, and global communities. Much like today's first event of the day, titled Traffic to Survivorship, Unity Through Social Change, we encourage you guys to continue the conversation outside these doors on how we can understand these events uh, globally and also uh, locally and how the issues relate to our own lives. Um, so now getting into an intro to the event. Um, as we know, gender-based violence, <coughs> gender -based violence um, is an issue that has become increasingly highlighted um, as technology advances. Um, and this can, this kind of violence can come in many forms, such as domestic abuse, unhealthy relationships, and human trafficking, um, which was discussed earlier today. Um, this issue, however, is not uh, perpetrated by the men in our society. The root of the issue actually lies in how our boys and men are raised, um, which means we're all different. Um, we are here today to unravel these gender expectations and facilitate a discussion about the harm these expectations can bring um, and how we can work together to um, help current generations unlearn toxic masculinity and raise future generations um, without imposing these socially constructed restrictions. Um, our, work, our hope in this work is that all people, regardless of gender, are able to live lives that are mentally, physically, and emotionally healthy. Um, and we also have a very special guest in helping uh, us facilitate this discussion today. So I'd like to talk about the community partner that joined us today. So Vibes, formerly known as Vibs, has been a pioneer in domestic violence and the rape crisis movement, serving victims of violence since 1976. Vibes merged last year with the Empowerment Collaborative of Long Island, or ECLI, which co-leads the Suffolk County Anti-Trafficking initi uh, Initiative with the Suffolk County Police Department and provides critical support to criminally involved youth and victims of human trafficking. In 2021 alone, they served over 2,700 victims of trauma, providing valuable advocacy, legal counseling, support, and or medical services to victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, trafficking, elder abuse, child abuse, and much more. The two representatives from Vibes that are here today are Dr. Heather Parrott and Diane Linares. Dr. Parrott received her PhD in sociology from the University of Georgia with a focus on gender, race, and class inequality. She also has direct service experience, experience with victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, and child abuse. Dr. Parrott also taught classes in gender violence for about 12 years at Long Island University before joining the staff of ECLI Vibes as the Director of Development in March 2021. Diane Lenars is a bilingual community educator and volunteer coordinator at ECLI Vibes. She's from Omaha, Nebraska, where she worked as a domestic violence and human trafficking advocate for over seven years and provided trauma-informed advocacy, case management, immigration services, and other support services to survivors. Before they come to join us today, Sarah and I have actually prepared a few activities to introduce their lecture. All right. So, um, before I um, talk, before I do any of these um, presentations, I think it's always important to make sure that people understand um, what they're walking in. So I was actually going to give a brief um, trigger warning and disclaimer. Um, this presentation may contain topics such as mental health, emotional and physical abuse, as well as sexual assault. Um, if you are uncomfortable with any of these topics, please exercise caution as well as self-care when listening to this presentation. And this can look like putting both feet on the ground um, and focusing on your breathing. And if you need to um, step out for a second, take a walk, grab a, uh, a, um, some water, um, you're more than welcome to do so. We want to make sure that everyone is comfortable with having this discussion today. Um, if you feel that you or someone near you may be suffering from violence um, or abuse in a relationship or suicidal thoughts or actions, you can contact the National Suicide Prevention Line at their 24-hour number or at their website. Um, you can also contact the National Domestic uh, Violence Hotline um, pictured on the screen as well. Um, if you want to learn more about healthy relationships, you can visit lovesuspect.org. Feel free to take a photo of all of these references. We also have um, little note cards at the table that you passed when you came in the door um, with all of these um, 
with all of these numbers and websites so that way you can have them like in your wallet or something like that. Um, I have them all um, saved in my phone as contacts. So. talk a little bit first about what is toxic masculinity. Um, toxic masculinity is defined as adherence to traditional male gender roles that consequently stigmatize and limit the emotions boys and men may comfortably express while elevating other emotions such as anger. Um, it's marked by economic, political, and social expectations that men seek and achieve dominance and maintain that throughout their lives. Its counterpart is actually toxic femininity, which has the same definition, however, it does refer to the standards and expectations for people who are female identifying. Okay. So, we're gonna do a fun little activity here um, before our uh, representatives from Vibes come up um, and join us today. Um, on the first slide, we are going to write characteristics that are related to uh, stereotypical men. On the second part of the activity, we're gonna be doing the same, um, but for um, what a woman is supposed to be. And this activity is called the gender box. If you haven't already, um, please go to joinpd.com so that you can take part in this um, activity and use the code that's up on the screen. It's E-P-T-F-F-F. -F -F. Um, this code will remain up at the top. Um, <coughs> So, um, first off, we're gonna talk about kind of what a man is supposed to be. And all of the submissions that you put through Care Deck um, are going to be anonymous. Um, and there are, there's no limitation in terms of um, censorship because we're gonna get into um, a little bit more why that is um, in the next part of this activity. But what stereotypically um, do you think of when you hear be a man? What is a man supposed to look like? Um, I just kind of show what we've got going on. So, you know, we've got, um, we often get descriptors of what is he supposed to look like? Um, what um, can we think of in terms of career paths that he's supposed to choose? What kind of relationships do he have? does he have? Um, so we have uh, macho, strong, masculine, straight, um, tough, strong, unemotional. A man is a person who is superior to all around him. They're supposed to have no emotions and just be strong doesn't cry, that's a big one, um, egotistical. Um, these are all really, really great responses and they all say a lot about what we're taught um, to expect from men. Um, and especially when, you know, I, we have a fair amount of male identified people in the room and I'm sure all of you guys have heard the phrase be a man at least once. Um, so what does that phrase um, inspire in you in terms of social response? So, for the next um, slide, we're still on the topic of being a man, um, but this time we're gonna do it a little bit differently. Um, this activity is called the gender box because a lot of these um, stereotypical um, characteristics of what a man is supposed to be um, kind of create a box that, that men um, and boys are crammed into. Um, and so if a man strays or a boy strays too far outside the box, um, there are certain um, words and phrases that are used to kind of push them back in. Um, and so this is when um, censorship becomes um, something that we kind of throw out the window because I'm about to ask you to put up on the screen um, words and phrases that are used to keep a man inside the box. Yeah, so we have um, slurs regarding sexuality. We have the word weak. Um, yep, don't be pussy. We have a lot of um, references to the female genitalia used um, to scare men into being um, tougher. Sensitive, sissy, um, men don't cry. Um, even be a man is another um, phrase that is used often, which is why it was up on the um, up on the board as well. Um, failure. Yep. So these are all really, really great responses. I'm trying to scroll through them slowly because I don't have enough time to um, highlight them all verbally. Um, but yeah, only girls are into like painting your nails or. Um, you know, growing their hair a little bit longer or, you know, different um, fashion trends. Um, absolutely. All right, so can we move on now? This is going to take a few minutes and a half. So much like our Be A Man activity, uh, the first slide, we're asking you to describe characteristics that you think are stereotypical to people who are female identifying. 
Essentially, ask yourself, what does it mean to quote unquote, act like a lady rather than be a man? And so let's see what sort of responses we're getting here. Prim and proper, weak. Do what everyone wants. Feminine, sensitive, dainty, emotional. Yeah, so you, people pleaser. As, as you can see, gentle, dramatic, too emotional. Be quiet and calm, too emotional. She's crying because she's a girl. Because uh, of course men don't cry, you know. Um, Self-censorship, quiet, stop being so bossy. Sweet, generous, comforting, housewife. So yeah, those are definitely characteristics that are very stereotypical of women and that's the box that, the, that society essentially pushes them into. So now what we would like you to do is much like on the last slide, um, consider what it means to quote unquote act like a lady and what sort of phrases or words or anything that, they, that people use to shove women back into that box. So what does it mean to quote unquote act like a lady? And let's see what sort of responses we have. Cross your legs when you sit. That's something that a lot of people don't even think about. It's, it's very, it's a very subtle thing. You need to be submissive. Your family is first, not your career. Let's see, we're getting a lot of responses up there. That was not very ladylike. You'll never make a good wife with that behavior. Yeah, when women are assaulted, it's their fault. Some sort of like victim blaming for what they were wearing. Stop being hysterical. Think of how many men were ever called hysterical in their lifetimes. Who wears the pants in your family? Always be presentable. When are you having kids? Because there is an expectation that women have children. You sound crazy. Why can't you have kids? Yeah, so these are really great responses to kind of show the, the boxes that society has constructed for men, both men and women. So, um, this is just a quick little slide because obviously there's a ton of um, nuance and intersectionality when it comes to talking about issues like this. Um, Masculine is a really great film. Um, and it's by the, made by the Representation uh, Project and it's available on Canopy, which I think all, some libraries, uh, public libraries are on Canopy. Um, and then also it's available on YouTube. Um, and then I also want to give a big thank you to uh, Maine Boys to Men, which is an organization um, based in um, Falmouth, um, for letting us uh, utilize some of their curriculum and build in this uh, activity for you today. All right, so now we're going to pass the mic over to our affinity partner, Bryce. Oh, thank you all for having us today. And uh, thank you so much for that introduction exercise from Sarah and Alex. It was really fantastic in leading us into uh, the talk today. I am not used to being at a podium. I'm used to like wandering around, um, but uh, I will try my best here. Um, okay, so actually in talking about this issue, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my background um, because I do think it like highlights my passion about the issue of gender and the work that I do now. So when I was a sophomore in college, someone told me, um, I went to college, Charleston Honors College in Charleston, South Carolina, and somebody said, hey, you should really get an internship. You guys have probably heard stuff like that. And so when I was a sophomore in college, I looked around at potential internships, and I ended up at an internship with um, People Against Rape, the Rape Crisis Center in Charleston, South Carolina. And I uh, did their training and started helping victims in the hospital. It was what I did my internship. I went to the hospital to help victims of sexual assault and rape. And after about two months of doing that, um, they had some staff turnover and they were like, hey, you're doing a good job at your internship. Any chance you want a full-time job? And uh, I took a full-time job at 19 years old and it was like totally crazy because like, as you guys know, being a full-time college student and having a full-time job, they don't go together very well. But I spent basically 
all of my nights and all my weekends at the hospital with rape victims. And I did that for about um, two years uh, and probably saw about 350 rape victims in the hospital, ranging from six months old, a little girl who did not live, to an 83-year-old grandparent, grandma. But the vast majority of cases that I went to the hospital with were college students, mostly college females. And um, one of the things I found really striking was after a while, I would listen to people's stories in the hospital and I would be like, oh, this story sounds familiar. I know that person. I, before they even said the name of the rapist, I knew what the name of the rapist was. And it was like, and this was like, there were a few like key guys and a few really, to be very honest, key fraternities who were the serial rapists. We, as soon as they said the name, I'd be like, all right, we'll just go put another, you know, another name in his file back at our rape crisis center. And they get away with it. And so I became very interested in gender violence. I went to um, the hospital probably with about 12 male rape victims, all of whom were raped by males. I became like the go-to person that the hospital would call because they know I could handle male rape victims. And um, just became really fascinated with the idea of like, what is happening here? Why are there so many women, children, males being raped by males? So I went on to graduate school, got my degree in sociology from College of Charleston Honors College, and went on to graduate school in sociology, kind of spoiler, I think it has something to do with socialization. And um, while I was in graduate school, I worked full time, yeah, again, not having very good balance, like over, overextending myself, but I worked full time at a rape crisis center for five years. No, sorry, not rape crisis center, at a domestic violence shelter. And at the domestic violence shelter, I would help women, because it was a women's shelter, women and their families escape from violence. And I would check them into the shelter and I ran all of the women's and children's support groups at the shelter, which will come up again in a second. I went on to teach, I got a job at Long Island University where I taught gendered violence um, and became a tenured professor at Long Island University. And about six years ago, I went to a community event here on Long Island, it was actually a Her Story Gala, and I met this like really dynamic group of women. Um, they were, they just started this nonprofit ECLI, Empowerment Collaborative of Long Island, and I said, hey, like, I'm just an academic, but do you have any need for like, you know, any sort of research or data help, and go figure, you offer free work to people and they take you up on it. So I started like, working with ECLI about six years ago, helping with their data. Um, then they started the Human Trafficking Task Force and I became the research partner of the Human Trafficking Task Force. And then about a year ago, they took over Vibes and the executive director of ECLI gave me a call and said, hey, we probably need more data help. So I left my job at Long Island University and am now the development director here at ECLI Vibes and love it. And I think this is like this great opportunity to come back in and talk about everything that I've learned about gender violence and gender and how gender leads into gender violence. Now, first of all, what I saw at the Rape Crisis Center, yeah, it's pretty much like fits what we see statistically. So about one in six uh, women has ever been in the United States, has ever been a victim of attempted or completed rape in their lifetime. Though, if you look at globally, it's one in three women. Um, about, what is the number for men? About one in every 33 men in the United States. So about 3% of men have been victims of attempted or completed rape or sexual assault. And college age students are are more at risk of this. But I wanna get back to gender and talk about gender a little bit. So um, luckily we have this awesome exercise leading into this. So what are the effects? Why is the way that we construct gender, this dichotomous way of women are supposed to be like this and men are supposed to be like this, 
why could this be bad for individuals? You don't have to go to the mic. You can yell out your answer. It's not? Like it's totally peachy? Yeah. Um, it doesn't allow people to express who they truly are and make them feel alienated and ostracized. Absolutely. It doesn't allow people to express who they are. That is such a, and that is like, so if we have like, all women are supposed to be like this, and all men are supposed to be like this, and we divide all possible traits into two separate categories, yeah. It doesn't allow people their full range of expression. Absolutely, 100%. We become stuck in these boxes about what is appropriate and not appropriate. So how is it bad for relationships? Someone else, brave it. Good for relationships, yeah. response yeah like if we're stuck in their box or partner stuck in the box or we're both stuck in boxes like how does that work out so first of all we have like I mean if you just think about it if women are socialized to think that it's okay to be emotional it's good to share your feelings and men are taught like you can't be emotional you can't share your feelings what happens when they get in a relationship with one another like we need like relationship marriage is not easy we need like open communication with one another and we need to be able to express our full range of emotions and like if we can't do that it's not setting us up for a very like productive open relationship but i want to kind of come back to like the, this like man box activity and these two like if everything's divided into like what men should supposed to, what men are supposed to be what women are supposed to be um one of the things that I think is really important to note is that we don't see these as equal. When kids grow up thinking about gender and learning about gender, they don't learn that men, you know, boys and girls are just different. They get messages that boys are better. This isn't like, it's not like, you know, most parents sit down and say, look, boys are better than girls. We get these subtle messages. What are the subtle messages? Tell me some of the subtle messages you get. Girls can't play, girls can't play certain sports. What else? Yeah. Yeah, I need some strong boys to help me carry these chairs. I got this. Um, I was with my um, my. Uh, brother's family and I was helping a couple of years ago um, helping get their their son who was like four years old at the time get ready for bed and he was like I don't want to go to bed and I don't want to brush my teeth and I was like oh come on like like let's go like I'll like you know I'll race you upstairs to go brush your teeth and his mom said you better go you don't want to be beaten by a girl and I was like what hold on would that be so bad to be beaten by a girl but we get these messages, right? And of course his mom wasn't like, you know, ah, you need to show him that he's better than you. It wasn't intentional. But we hear these things throughout our culture. Don't throw like a girl, don't cry like a girl, don't let a girl beat you. And you're like, oh my God, would that be the worst thing ever to like, you know, be beaten by a girl? Like, but think about these subtle messages that kids get. And it's not intentional. It's like embedded in our culture and our socialization. And that, like, think about how that sets up boys, men, to think about their place in society, that they have to be better than girls. It can't just be different, it has to be better. And we have to think about, like, this power dynamic I have on here, like, toxic masculinity is about gender and power. Like, and when we think about Power, 
like certainly we could have people who are more powerful in society exerting themselves, but when we think about some of the most like egregious forms of toxic masculinity, when we think about like domestic violence, sexual assault, often these men don't feel too powerful. This is how they are exerting their power. Like often the, you know, and many people find it surprising if you look at like the statistics of who are perpetrators of domestic violence, Perpetrators of domestic violence are often people who have less education than the people they are abusing, lower earning power than the people they are abusing. They are often much more insecure. Oh, this seems weird, but this is how they are exerting their power. They are exerting their force. They are asserting themselves through these like huge shows of these violent um, expressions of power. Um, so how does this affect society? Hmm. Well, when you think about it, like we have, if men are growing up to believe that they are better than females, not just different, but better, what happens when they're competing with females in their jobs? What happens like, you know, how does that play out? And it often plays out in toxic masculinity in their jobs. And I've got a great kind of example. Um, when we think about sexual harassment, and I think the literature on sexual harassment, I think, paints a really nice like, like picture of how uh, gender affects sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, so kind of some of the things, like if you look at all the literature on sexual harassment, some of the things that, there are really three main things that set the stage for sexual harassment. One is the construction of gender, which in sociology we call doing gender. Like how gender is expressed. Like how do we show gender? And often it is like exerting, exerting power, exerting toughness. There are some really disturbing um, studies of sexual assault in schools that really get at this doing gender, where it's like, you know, why did you grab that girl in the hallway? Oh, because I needed to show to my friends that I was manly, that I was masculine, and I need to prove my masculinity. Oh, right. That's kind of messed up. But like, that is what, you know, often what we see, some of the most toxic behavior that we see in schools is boys kind of proving masculinity to each other, right? Proving that they're appropriately masculine. They don't want, those like, don't be, you know, all the negative things that we saw on our slides a few minutes ago, minutes ago. Um, then we have like the organizational structure of workplaces that typically, like if we look at like still, and though things are changing, it's like who is more likely to be in positions of power? Well, if we look at traditional workplaces that males are more likely to be in positions of power. We can look at Fortune 500 companies still and the fact that they're predominantly men as CEOs to see that this is still the case in many workplaces. Um, so workplace hierarchies can lead to um, sexual harassment if more men are in positions of power to assault um, or to harass. Sex ratios in the workplace. It's probably unsurprising to everybody in here that like if it's a male dominated workplace, that sexual harassment is more like a women is more likely to occur in those settings. Um, so that, you know, if it's a, to take an extreme example, if there's a one female construction worker on a construction site that's predominantly male, she's probably going to like deal with sexual harassment in that, like that is not surprising. Um, versus like, our organization at ECLI Vibes, which is predominantly female, I don't think anybody's gonna be dealing with like sexual harassment in that job. Um, I hope not, my gosh, that would go like completely counter to what we do. Um, but then another thing that I'm gonna keep coming back to, which is tolerance. Whether that behavior is tolerated in the, in the setting. Um, and tolerance is huge. Do we tolerate that behavior? Um, so like if someone's sexually harassed and nothing happens to them, well, sexual harassment is probably going to continue. Like what is there to stop it? 
We'll come back to tolerance in a minute. And then there's unequal social power, which is not redundant to gender, because when we really think about, like, it's not redundant to doing gender. So unequal social power. About a third of women, 34% of women who are sexually harassed in the workplace are sexually harassed by people who are co-workers, not by people in positions of power. Why is it that someone who is your coworker feels as though they can sexually harass you? This is beyond the workplace. This is like unequal social power that males would feel that they could do that to a female and get away with it. It's also probably tolerance, but like we have unequal social power going on here. Oh, is there like, can this be on? I have like, that'd be great, sorry. Let's pause. So spoiler, I am gonna ask you in a minute what we can do about it. So as you listen to this, think through like what we can do. I don't wanna just, I mean, I don't wanna just pose it as a problem. I want us to talk about effective solutions. Are you saying this book with our partner? Yeah, that's okay. I have it a little tricked out, so you know, I wanna be sure I can show my like thing popping up in the back. Okay. Today, some I was trying to look up some statistics for um, who are the perpetrators of different types of violence, and it's amazingly difficult to get at these numbers. Um, I was looking to update the numbers I already had, and it's difficult because so often, especially when we talk about gendered violence, we talk about things um, in a very passive way, like how many victims were sexually assaulted, like you know. 70% of women are sexually assaulted. Like, we don't talk about who does the assaulting. We don't talk about who does the harassing. Like, whether it's men or women, it often stays kind of, like, hidden. But I did find some statistics. And when we look at, like, what percentage of violence is committed by men, we see that 61 of 62 um, mass shooters are men. This isn't surprising when we think about mass shooter when like you hear that there's a mass shooting, chances are a picture of a man comes in your mind, not a female. 77% of aggravated assaults are committed by men. 86% of armed robberies. 87% of firearm suicides. Thus, like men are being harmed by themselves here. 90% of murder. 86% of domestic violence incidents, 99% of rapes are committed by men. So this is what I kept coming back to in like my social work class. Like, what is happening here? What is going on? So let me pose that to you. What is going on here? So one question that literature has come back to repeatedly is, is it inevitable? Yeah. I just feel like men aren't held accountable for like a lot of these things. They're just normalized in a lot of societies and people like to turn a blind eye towards it. Yeah, so maybe it's normalized. Yeah, and I think a lot of the negative things are normalized. So it comes back to tolerance, right? Like that we might tolerate it, like we might not hold people accountable enough when they commit these crimes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We're socialized to, to, to address these things in an aggressive or violent way. Yeah. Probably told it. 
but that's really great. Yeah, it's like if you're socialized to believe that you should have power, like if you perceive that you've lost the power, that there's like an impulse to to address it in some way. Is there another? Yeah. I teach, as I was mentioned, I used to teach whole classes on gendered violence where I'd get into marital rape exemptions and stuff like that. Like, about, totally right on. Like, that we are we addressing all this, like, to the fullest extent that we can or should in the law? And, um, yeah, I, I do want to point out before moving on to the slide that it is not all men. This is not all men at all. Like, and I, it's one of the reasons I brought up at the beginning, like this, this like, you know, I'm going to the hospital with all these rape victims, and a lot of them are coming back to a few people, you know, that it's not all men who are doing this. But we do have to consider that, you know, there are a lot of men who are gonna be affected by it, you know, that they're gonna, you know, if they're even, you know, if they're not the people assaulting, um, but they might date women, marry women, who have undergone this this trauma that you know this does affect like this type of trauma does affect relationships um so it's not all men but men are disproportionately doing it so let's talk about what's going on here there's this really great um study done there were a couple studies that sanday uh did now she's a um cultural anthropologist and uh her study uh big study of tribal societies and looking at rape cross-culturally is quite old at this point. It's from the 70s. It doesn't matter that it's old because one of the things that she was interested in is like whether gendered violence is inevitable. Basically, the question she asked is like, would all men rape if given the opportunity? And what she found and how she studied this is she looked at different societies and looked at the prevalence of rape across 90 different, 95 different societies and tribal bands. And she was looking at like, how prevalent is rape in these various societies? And interestingly, she found that, uh, I wanna be sure I get my numbers right. She found that uh, she was able to divide societies and these, these groups into a few different categories. And she found that about 47% of the societies she this 47% of the societies she looked at were relatively rape free. And 18% uh, are what she categorized as rape prone societies. Now some of the differences between the societies is very interesting. So relatively rape free societies um, were societies where males and females were integrated in everyday life, um, that males and females were included in all activities, including domestic activities, so there's more like equality between men and women, so kind of coming back to this gender roles issue. Um, in rape-prone societies, there was greater sex segregation, more male social dominance, um, so we see that gender and the role of gender in society makes a difference. Now, one of the really positive things is that uh, about the study is that it's not inevitable. So if we can like have societies where it's not as common, that means we can we can untangle this like uh, toxic masculinity. There are ways to do this on a cultural level. Um, Sandy went on and she looked at also, um, she applied kind of her theories from this to things like fraternities and like what's going on in fraternities. And she looked at many fraternities, male fraternities, as rape prone organizations and kind of what happens, like what is the, and one of the things that she found in it is that a lot of fraternities, a lot of, um, a lot of athletic teams get uh, kind of special treatment, that there is that tolerance, that there is, they like, hold a special place in, this, in like, schools, and um, I meant to mention one particularly notable case I went on when I was um, 
when I was working at the Rape Crisis Center. Um, and I went to the hospital with a college student who had been brutally raped by seven members of our um, basketball team, College of Charleston basketball team. And she was admitted to the hospital. And the story started to get out and started to gain traction. She was planning on pressing charges. And uh, I went to the hospital with her and I was visiting and following up with her afterwards. And she was visited by the college president who sat down with her and said, well, you can't do this to our guys. Colin Charleston had a good basketball team that year and he was really worried about the effects on the basketball team. And she dropped the charges. She dropped the charges, she dropped out of school, she went home. And for when the news of her dropping the charges got out, oh, she must have been lying. Oh yeah, she became the liar. Oh, she dropped the charges because she was lying. I knew she wasn't lying. But I also knew the tolerance, the protection that was being given. Now imagine these situations if that if they hadn't been tolerant, if the college president had come out like behind her and said, This is unacceptable. <clears throat> like showing intolerance, showing that you're not gonna put up with it, that make could make a huge stand. But often we tolerate this within our institutions. Often we protect this. Certainly this is uh, from a Yale um, fraternity. They went through, this is 10 years ago, went through campus chanting, no means yes, yes means anal. Um, we have lots of examples of fraternities behaving badly. Whenever we see this in the news, I always keep an eye out for how this is being addressed. Uh, is this being tolerated? Are we addressing this form, these forms of toxic masculinity? And we see other areas in our society that I would argue are, you know, I think many people would argue like military, military sexual assault, how prevalent it is. Like for women in the military, for men in the military, how are we behaving towards that? How are, are we tolerating it as a society? Are we calling it out? It is not, I don't believe it's inevitable. A lot of times in classes, like I'll have people who will say, oh, but what about testosterone? Well, uh, guys, give yourself more like, like, you know, credit than that. You're just being driven by your testosterone. Like, no, for one, like if it's testosterone, then like we would see it across societies, probably in equal amounts. Um, but even if we take testosterone, if we look at what happens, like, with acts of aggression in testosterone, what we see is that there's an act of aggression and then testosterone levels go up. It is the social that is affecting the biological, not the other way around. Most people think like, oh, if you have high testosterone, you're more likely, no, it's like the act of aggression and then testosterone. So we need to think about how we can stop this. What do we do as a society? And we're gonna get into it in a minute, Diane's going to talk about what we're doing at ECLI Vibes to address these issues of gendered violence. But I want to ask you guys, what do we do? Based on what I said, based on your own ideas, how do we address this? What do we do about gendered violence? What do we do about toxic masculinity? I'm hoping to give you some ideas. starting early like it's okay for girls to have trucks and boys to have barbies like why not like yeah like you know versus like if you go into a toy store now it's like oh well, this is the boy section and that glowing pink section that's the girl section clearly like you know so not being dichotomous yeah
Oh yeah, and then you look at boys' clothes. Like I've got a, I've got a yeah, nine-year-old yeah. boy, and it's like all the. If you get graphic tees, it's like killer. Like, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I have all but they right? Super gendered in the way that we look at toys and the way that we look at clothes. Most definitely, yeah. I remember going into when my when my daughter was uh, three years old, going into her daycare at the same time to pick her up as this dad, and the kids were all playing dress up, and the dad's son had this boa that he was wearing, and dad freaked out. I mean, like super, like 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 that. His I mean, he really seemed to believe that like his son was going to be gay now that he wore a pink boa and like that. That was good then that was like super problematic and but he freaked out like my son is not to be wearing like you know women's clothing and they actually removed all female clothes from the dress up area from that day on it was like too big a deal like but like yeah just like this total restriction that there are certain things that are appropriate for men there are certain things that are appropriate for women and they I, I would definitely argue that women are more able in our society to like do male things. Like being a tomboy, eh, like can be kind of cool. Like to be a tomboy. The alternative, boys, like we are adjusting culturally. Like we're having, we're not seeing gender as binary anymore. Like we are adjusting, but we have a ways to go. Yeah. socialized just through our parents like yeah they are like prime our family is our primary like agent of socialization but like not all parents are gonna like you know like like my sister-in-law who said oh don't be beaten by girl like not all parents are gonna think through this like people in this room might think through it but i do think it, that makes it up to religious leaders and up to like teachers and up to like, you know, friends to think through this stuff and to try to do better when it comes to our reactions to these things. Um, yeah. Thank you. 
Or even like McDonald's Happy Meal, boy or girl. for citizenships for Norway and <laughs> <laughs> Sounding really good. <laughs> is women saying like, how do I be sure that my son, who has grown up in a home seeing me abused, doesn't grow up to learn that that's okay? And one of the things that we always said, I have a greater appreciation now that I understand the full extent of the literature, is like, involve that boy in all aspects of the home. Like, have him fold his own laundry, have him help. Don't divide things into boys and girls like chores. Like have him have a greater appreciation for all the work that goes on in the home, everything that you do in the home. But one of the things that we do find is that the literature on um, intergenerational um, violence, that yes, if a boy grows up in a violent home or a girl grows up in a violent home, uh, they do have a greater likelihood of moving on, becoming, going into adult violent relationships themselves. But this is not, like, this is not inevitable at all. They have a greater likelihood, but this is not inevitable. There are some things that have been proven to break this cycle. One is having a trusted adult. It does not need to be a parent. Having a trusted adult, having a mentor, having a grandparent, having a, a big brother, big sister program, having a religious leader, who can be a trusted adult that someone can go to. That trusted adult can do some of those like socialization things that we've, we're talking about kind of wanting to overturn. Having a safe location to go. Having a church, having a community center, having a safe location to go is huge. I love this one. Developing an academic, artistic, or athletic talent. Like, and I think about this every time I hear things about them cutting like programs um, for like athletics and stuff in schools. Um, and avoiding self-blame, it's why counseling is so important for kids or for anybody who has experienced types of trauma. I have used up almost all of our time. So I'm gonna pass this over to Diane, who can talk about what we do, ECLI Vibes as an organization, to help with gender violence and education. Vibes, like this is our mission is to create futures um, free of violence, and one of the ways of that is like kind of target like the root of the issue. Um, so we can kind of put things in place, but if we don't address that issue, it's kind of hard to kind of bring about change. Um, one of the things that like that always comes to mind is like if we have a client who's struggling with like addiction or like um, other issues, like they're trying to apply for custody, but if they're homeless, it's kind of hard to kind of work through those things if they don't have um, stable housing. We kind of kind of get them kind of stable so they kind of work through those things. Um, but we provide kind of uh, trauma-informed care um, by trauma-informed trained um, individuals, so like advocates, our legal, and our counselors to kind of help like um, people who've been through domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse, child abuse, and trafficking by them with PTSD. We kind of kind of want to help everyone's kind of gone through some kind of trauma. And we do have um, many services available. So we have like legal assistance if someone needs help with like getting a protection order um, with uh, divorce, immigration, child custody, we're here to kind of help 
walk people through these things. We provide advocacy. They can kind of help with a victim or survivor, kind of go file a police report, help them file for public assistance, any things they might need. We also offer counseling, um, which is we offer it to anyone ages three and up. It's free, um, confidential, there's no charge, you don't have to have insurance. Um, if that is a barrier, then we kind of work through that to get those services that you may need. Um, we have community education, which is um, I'm part of that department. So what we do is we kind of go to schools to kind of talk about what healthy relationships are. I feel like that brings um, kind of like a big perspective for kids, especially if they grew up in homes where there was a lot of abuse, they can kind of know like, hey, this is what healthy is and what unhealthy is. And we always kind of focus on that power and control wheel so they can see how there can be that imbalance of power. Um, we also do like tabling events and we're also trying to get connected with student groups. So if you're part of a student group or a club, we'd love to partner with you to kind of train you and prepare you to bring that awareness on campus, but also kind of doing social media campaigns as well. With our same state program and our rape crisis counselors, um, these are the trained forensic nurses who do those sexual assault um, kits when people go into the hospitals. And our rape crisis counselors are the ones who are there who provide that moral and moral and emotional support, kind of hold someone's hand while they are getting that sexual assault kit done. If you are interested in doing that, that is a volunteer position that we have available. Then we have our study, our SCADI task force that you guys heard from Molly, the survivors earlier, which did a great job. And we also have our 24 seven um, confidential hotline. So if you have any questions, you need to talk to someone or you're going through a situation, our hotline is available for you. And someone will answer if it's two, three in the morning and that's when time you get a chance to talk, like we will answer and provide those services to you. Um, there's different ways to get involved with us. Um, I said invite us to speak to events or collaborate events like today's event. Um, you can also donate to our giving closet. Um, we did become a pantry with Island Harvest. So we now just, we have like perishable items and non-perishable items available to anyone who may need them. You can just kind of call our office. We can prepare something for you to pick up. Um, you can also do like any kind of donation drive. So we're kind of getting toiletries like pads, tampons, deodorant, shampoo, and these are all kind of put there for our clients. So if they're in need, they can just kind of come in and shop around. Um, and then we also do gift card drives as well to kind of if the client needs to buy clothes for work or get gas, we have those things available. Um, you can become an ongoing volunteer as well. Um, you can fill out our, the application online on our website. Um, we have different areas that you can be an ongoing volunteer in. Um, and if that's kind of a lot right now, but I know you guys are all in school, we do have our monthly volunteer nights, which are the first Thursday of each month in our office in Highlandia from 6 to 8 p.m. And we do provide dinner and snacks. And then you can also follow us on social media. We are on Instagram and on Facebook. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a little bit of time over. left uh, in the event, and so we would love it if you guys had questions. Um, any of the four of us would be um, willing to answer them, so we're going to open up to a little bit of a Q&A session. And also, there's a microphone right there, so please do not feel like you need to raise your hand. Just stand up, come straight to the mic, and say anything that you need.
It was mentioned at the beginning that we have 3,000, we helped 3,000 people last year and our numbers just keep going up. We help um, everything like from food needs for clients because truly like clients can't start healing until we address their basic needs, you know? Like we can't expect someone to prosecute their, you know, trafficker or abuser if they're worried about their basic needs, if they're just hungry. So we have to like, and then, so everything from like food to housing, we have a new housing program. So we really like try to help in, in every way possible. And Diane's been amazing at coordinating volunteers and starting volunteer nights. So hopefully we can start doing that. Yeah. I have a question because you guys kind of touched on like breaking the cycle. So growing up, like my family, we didn't really follow traditional roles. Um, but when I had told like, cause I'm, I'm Mexican, so I feel in Mexican culture, it's very, um, machismo is promoted a lot where you're expected to be a man, not like a man, and women just be submissive. And so when I would tell my friends that my dad cooks and cleans and like when my parents work, they kind of like look down on him. Um, so like my question is, what advice would you give to someone who's trying to change the culture when the culture itself does not want to change and keeps um, it, uh, keeps promoting that same idea? Um, I like to speak on that. Um, I am one of those people who have kind of have a to traditional, like I'm also Mexican as well, like roles. Um, I'm older, so by now I should be married, have kids, have done all these things, um, but I'm not. And I would just say, like, kind of keep being that voice and be like, hey, I, that's not a healthy way to do things. And you might get backlash because I brought it myself. I know there's one thing where um, in Mexican culture, like, the men are served first, the men eat first. And once they are done, women can eat as well. And, like, you're also supposed to, like, serve your partner, your boyfriend, or whatever it may be. But I'm always like, hey, they are healthy. They are capable. Um, they should be doing these things, too. Um, so don't be afraid to kind of be that voice and be like, hey, everyone should be equal. No one should have more power and control. And yeah, there'll always be resistance, but if we are willing to kind of fight and make change, we can bring generational change for others that come after us. Thank you. Yeah.
becomes more than how you're trained and masculinity is modeled, but identity form, you double down on it. We seem to be there politically. How does the spirit setting talks about that? Where if I'm li- if I'm listening to this, I, what, what you're talking about for the first time, and I think she's saying I shouldn't behave the way I, I've been rewarded for behaving my whole life the way my dad has behaved, or my brother's behaved, or my friends behaved. Uh, screw that. This is who I am. And everyone else's idea. Because like we're in a time, and, and I <laughs> uh, try to filter what I want to say because I think that there are groups of men for sure in our country who are grappling with that right now. Um, but I, I and I think that's a challenge, and I think that um, I guess the more that we can, I don't know. I, I certainly have mixed message, m- m- mixed messages culturally. Like if you look at movies and like girls like bad boys in movies and stuff like that. <laughs> it's like, okay, so like, you know, the bad boy gets the girl here, but now we're saying that he shouldn't be the bad boy. Like, I think that, I, I do think we're, that we're at a time of transition and that you do have men who are caught in that time of transition. I sure wish men would get more pissed off about gender violence. They could donate, they could like move their passion and anger towards that. But um, I don't know. I don't know if I've got a good response to that. Do you have, yeah, go for it. Um, so, fun fact, I got involved in anti-trafficking work and gender-based violence prevention work um, when I was uh, 12 years old, which sounds like a lie, but I promise it's not. Um, but I came across this a little bit um, when I was a sophomore in high school lecturing senior boys um, on toxic masculinity. Um, there was a lot of backlash, mostly because I was uh, two years younger than them and female, and um, I obviously don't I don't have any work experience um, in terms of being raised in, in this society as a man. Um, but I think an important um, thing to um, kind of hit home when talking about this sort of stuff um, with boys who um, have these traits kind of ingrained in them and their identities um, is that a, it's not their fault. Um, we try a really, really hard to make sure that we're not man shaming or man blaming. Um, we are um, blaming the society in which they were raised. Therefore, harm has been inflicted on them. Um, and changing the way that um, men are taught to behave will benefit men. If we're talking about something that could on the surface sound like taking power away from men, we can instead kind of shift the narrative and say, well, how will this benefit you? Whenever you're talking about equalizing the scale, you have to think about how to convince the people in power um, that it will in fact benefit them and not take away um, from the identities that they have created. Isn't that true? Talking about power can be so difficult because most people, I mean, if you're talking to men about power, most men don't feel powerful at all. And power is such a difficult thing to discuss because it's like power can shift from one like circumstance to another circumstance. Like you could be powerful at work, at home but not at work or like, um, and then power is divided, you know, power is different across racial and ethnic backgrounds. Like, you know, as um, someone who is white, I have more societal power um, over over people who are non-white. Um, but as a woman, you know, I have less power than someone who's a male in our society. So power is a very difficult thing to discuss, especially um, for people who don't feel very powerful. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, why do you think that it's a lot easier for society and people to accept um, top, like tomboy, like girls that like to dress kind of more masculine, and then it's harder for the world to kind of accept femboys? Like feminine guys who like to get more feminine. I I do think it's much. I, I do th- I don't know why, but certainly within our society, I do think we place more restrictions on males um, than we do on females. Um, I mean, we can see lots of lots of examples of this. Um, 
I, I think that it's more strongly associated for males with sexuality for some reason, and it's more upheld um, by by men. I don't really know. I don't know why. Do you have a theory on that why? I think it's like, especially for me, like I'm someone who dresses more modestly. So like, it, like in my culture, like most of the men, like if they dress feminine in any way, sorts of like, like any in any way, it would just be like a big no no. So like I feel like with women, when we dress more um, kind of masculine, it's okay because we're covering our bodies, and that's a justification of it all. So maybe it has something to do with that. Like for men, they shouldn't have to, they shouldn't be dressing tighter because then it's like you're being a, you're being a woman. Like yeah, I think that might be some. I did an activity for many years in my gender classes where I'd have females go out and break a gender norm and males go out and break a gender norm. Um, I always found that women had a harder time. It's like, oh, so what am I going to do? I'm going to go, uh, we'll wear pants now. It's okay for us to wear pants. Like, spread my legs wide out. Like, you know, that they were like, but that men, they had a whole range skirt to class and going to wear a purse. I actually had uh, one of my students, I stopped doing the exercise because he almost got beaten up for ordering a girly drink at a bar. Like, and these guys came up and was like, we don't want your kind in here. I'm like, oh my god. Finally, the kid had to be like, yeah, I'm sorry, it's just for a class. To not be beaten up for ordering a fortini or something at a bar. Can I ask when that was? Like, what, like what year or time? Was it it was about 10 years ago. So I hope we've gotten better in the last 10 years. I hope we have. But how ridiculous is it that we are so restrictive that people can't even order whatever drink they want to bar? So I don't know why it's different for males and females. Certainly when I was growing up, a couple of years ago, um, when I was growing up, um, like it was still like, I remember like girls in my high school, like, you know, the ones who went out and surfed with the guys, it wasn't like stigmatized, it was like cool. Like if you'd go and surf with the guys versus like, you know, the reverse, I don't know, playing dolls with a girl, that is not cool. And I don't know why we have the different. Though it is interesting because when you, if you look at statistics about gendered violence, certainly it's not that women are free of consequences. have a theory on that and I feel like this kind of relates to honestly a topic that I talk about in some of my political science classes because as you said earlier in your presentation being a man is just more valued in society it's almost like punching up versus punching down almost um, whereas when women go to reclaim that power because being a man is so valued in society they're kind of referred to as not like other girls they're cool they're one of the guys you know it's cool for them to act like a man versus like when, because being a woman is just not as valued in society, when men act more feminine, they're ridiculed for it. I like that theory. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
begin to gender segregated occupations because of the expectations of what they'll probably face in terms of their um, role within the home. Like, okay, well, I'll probably be the one who's like in charge of the kids. Or um, because of sexual harassment that they experience in male-dominated jobs. There's some really interesting studies of doctors in male-dominated jobs who choose um, female-dominated specialty areas after facing sexual harassment in med school. Women negotiate less for jobs, and uh, they're more um, stigmatized and penalized for negotiating. So it's like, you know, a man negotiates, he's like, take the opportunity. A woman negotiates, and she's like, uh, or like overly pushy or something. You know, we're, we're, we're like not supposed to be the negotiator. So yeah, there's definitely, we've got a long way to go. Yeah. different different wants and needs and so so 
along those lines, uh, sometimes when I'm asked, like, if we think it's a problem that there are more female nurses than male nurses, like in Norway, because we have that, we have, although we have much more equality, I would say, gender equality in Norway than we have here, but we still have a very segregated job market. Um, and I usually just say, I, I don't think it's this problem per se, if all those people actually really want to be where they are, but if it is the case that people have had to choose something that they didn't want to do just because they felt they couldn't do it because of this gender then it's a problem. Absolutely. I've had people tell me that I've actually had academics tell me that I'm a bad feminist because I wear dresses. <laughs> Like no, like my version of fem of, of, right. <laughs> of feminism is that like take you know I have a son and a daughter. I want both of them to feel that they could stay home with kids when they you know have a family if they want to, or they could both be president if they want to. Right. Like it should be like the ability of all options except for violence. All right, unfortunately we're gonna have to cut the conversation off there, but I want to thank Vibes again for coming with us. Please give them a round of applause. If you want to know more about the work that we do, visit our website, vibeslaudit.org.